Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Laura Rosick. I'm the director for the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. And welcome to our 2021-2022 lecture series. We are so excited to be back in Weiser Hall. We're on the 10th floor right now, and we are hybrid. So we have people here in the audience and some of you at home. Thank you so much for joining us. We're particularly happy that as we kick off our new seminar series and a new era um, after COVID, to welcome one of our alum back. Um, Aaron Michael Stern um, graduated from the political science department here, and he is currently a foreign service officer with the United States Agency for International Development, which he joined in 2007. He served in Washington, the Philippines, Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, Frankfurt, supporting Iraq, and Madagascar. He's currently the deputy county representative for USAID in Laos. He received his BA from Columbia University in economics. He then went to the University of Washington where he got a master's in public administration and international relations. And then his doctorate is from here at the University of Michigan in political science and comparative politics. Um, he's a Fulbright Hayes doctoral dissertation fellowship alumnus and also received a fellowship from the Ford Foundation for area studies work while at the University of Michigan. And we're particularly happy to have him here at this time, not only here to talk about how government declared disasters, but just a little bit of perspective of how his area studies work in, influences how he's able to do this kind of developmental work. And as most of you know, there is an opportunity for students to meet with Dr. Stern after this for an hour if you're interested. But with that, thank you so much for coming to the University of Michigan and kicking off a, our first hybrid session of the year. So we'll give him a minute. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay, do you have sound? Okay, if I hear my voice echoing in the room, clearly you have sound. Excellent. All right. Well, anyway, thank you very much for the very, very kind introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone who's. Uh, you know, here in the room, uh, Dr. Fung, I'd also like to thank you for your, all, you know, your assistance here. Um, uh, and thank you for everyone who's online. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be back uh, here in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan. This is the first time I have been back here since I graduated with my political science degree in 2006. So I think you can imagine that there have been more than a few changes here since I, uh, since I was last in Ann Arbor. Um, so I'm pleased to kind of come here and talk to you a little bit about uh, something that I think I've been doing a lot of work on, which is related to kind of disasters, the managing disasters, responding to them. Um, it's something I've actually been doing for much of my kind of career with the US Agency for International Development for the past 15 years. Um, I did want to put in a small disclaimer here. Um, I am here in a personal capacity. Uh, and I just wanted to kind of make that clear to everyone that uh, yes, I am an employee of the United States federal government. I am an employee of the United States Agency for International USAID, but the views that I'm expressing here and sort of the ideas are really my own. So I'm not actually here, if you will, representing the government and representing uh, USAID as an agency. And, uh, and so I just wanted to kind of get that out of the way so that every under, you know, understands that uh, uh, that what I say today is uh, not something that should be taken as an official U.S. government policy. Um, and as far as kind of you know, questions are concerned, I think probably given the, this hybrid format we're in, I would probably just you know, move through the presentation. Um, if there's something that really needs clarification, I'm more than happy to uh, you know, provide that if something is you know, unclear in what I'm saying as we go along, but probably it's best to hold the, the questions until the end. Okay. So my topic is again how um, clicker. Okay, that doesn't seem to be working. However, uh, how I could do this in a different way. There we go. So my topic was again how sort of how governments declare disasters, and I think what I wanted to do was start out with a. A kind of a, a little story from the Philippines, which is a, as, as some of you may know, is a, a country that's very kind of prone to uh, disasters. Uh, it's been this way for 
a long, long time. Uh, this was actually my first posting uh, was the Philippines, and it was a very enjoyable and a, a real learning experience. So this is uh, some photos that are connected with a, a typhoon that came in called Fengshan. It was uh, locally, it was called uh, Typhoon Frank. Uh, and it came in in 2008, and it hit uh, the Iloilo province. So this is kind of in the sort of western center, if you will, of the Philippines. Um, so as kind of typhoons go, I think probably by Philippine standards, this is definitely not one of the sort of super typhoons that hits the country. It was kind of a sort of a, a mid-sized one. Um, it did cause a certain amount of damage. Um, there were lives lost, a lot of, a lot of flooding and certain wind damage. Um, that damage was very limited uh, to, to sort of one area of the country. Um, the Philippines has a pretty strong kind of capability uh, for responding to disasters uh, and for you know, dealing with these kinds of situations after these storms come in. But uh, what was interesting about this was the response to this particular one was, was actually quite substantial. Um, and I want to explain kind of a little bit about this because a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is this kind of intersection, if you will, between sort of politics and sort of disaster management. So as you see there, we've got, um, you know, President George Bush Jr. Uh, and the, the president of the Philippines at that time, uh, Gloria Macabaga Arroyo. Um, it just so happened at the time that this typhoon hit that she was in the United States and was meeting with President Bush. And President Bush essentially came out with a very kind of general statement that said, we will do whatever we can to help our Philippine friends. That one statement launched what, in a sense, is sort of part of the story here on the sort of the right-hand photo. So at the time, there was a, uh, an aircraft, a United States aircraft carrier called the Ronald Reagan. Um, uh, aircraft carriers are not designed for disaster response. I just want to make that really clear. At the same time, though, the U.S. military has been a very good kind of partner, particularly with USAID, in doing kind of disaster response. They bring capabilities in that uh, very few other organizations have. So that entire aircraft carrier, after President Bush's comment, was actually diverted to go to the Philippines and it anchored about 20 kilometers off the, this disaster site, and they proceeded to sort of launch as best a response as they could. If you look in the photo on the right-hand side, you'll see sort of the front part of a helicopter there. Um, that is not a Philippine uh, helicopter. That is an American uh, helicopter. And as a matter of fact, that helicopter is designed for anti-submarine work, okay? So what they did was is they removed the seats to clear out as much space inside this thing as they could. And then they put in and they loaded it up with things like bottled water and various other supplies. And these helicopters, they sort of took over, the, basically the US military sort of with the Philippine authorities sort of took over one part of the airport and they sort of did these kind of helicopter runs around this island which had experienced the greatest level of damage. Um, at the same time, we've got a, on the, the green uh, plane up there is a Philippine Air Force C-17, so one of the biggest kind of military planes around. So these are, most of the people here are, these are um, armed forces of the Philippines. Um, they actually came in later uh, because, and I honestly think that the reason they came in was because, well, the American military is there. My goodness, the Philippine military needs to be there as well. You know, we can't, we can't have this be just, you know, purely a kind of a, uh, kind of a you know American sort of rescue effort, and they brought in these large quantities of, of bottled water. Um, any of you who have done disaster management work uh, will know that bottled water is not a great idea uh, for you know for providing water to people. There's a lot of other ways to do it. Um, you can set up you, you can set up water filtration systems. Uh, you can provide you know tablets to purify water. Um, but this is kind of what was come up with on very short notice. So from a disaster management perspective, this was a little bit unusual and maybe in some ways uh, at a scale that was much larger than one might think would be necessary for the scale of this disaster. And I don't want to um, kind of, uh, you know, diminish the fact that lives were lost. You know, a lot of property was damaged, but it, again, it happened in this very kind of limited area. But um, the, they declared a disaster, you know. And my guess is that the Philippine authorities with the military probably could have handled this one quite well.
but you had a political imperative here. You just happened, just really, this is purely coincidence that the two presidents were meeting at the time, and that launched a much, much larger effort. So this is really just to say, um, and this is again, just one example, very anecdotal, I understand that. Just to say that, you know, there's politics is behind many, many of these sort of decisions about, you know, when, how are governments to kind of, you know, declare a disaster. And when I de we declare a disaster, I mean, they're gonna say, they're gonna announce it publicly and say, we are ready to accept international assistance. That's really what a declaration means, as opposed to sort of handling it themselves. And, um, and that's what happened in this case. So this is, a, the, I admit this one is a bit unusual, but it, it sort of emphasizes some of, the, some of the points I'm gonna try and make today. Okay, there we go. So just a brief overview. Um, so I'm talking about disasters, governments, politics, disaster declarations. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, you know, give some background, talk a little about the role of government. Um, I'll try and talk a little bit about the, the you know, kind of existing literature on this. Um, I will tell you that much of my presentation is gonna be very much focused on kind of the more kind of practical side of the work that I do. Um, but I thought it was really important to reference some of that literature because there is a lot of scholarship on, um, you know, foreign aid, on, uh, you know, crisis management, um, on disasters, this kind of thing. And so it's, it's important to kind of see how the sort of world that I see is reflected in that scholarly literature as well. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about why this might actually matter to people. Uh, and it's the, the question we often ask ourselves in the world of USAID, which is, so what? You know, why should, why should we care about this issue? What difference is it going to make to people's lives? Um, and, then, um, and then sort of the decision to sort of, a, you know, kind of appeal for international assistance, which is kind of at the heart of this presentation. And then maybe just some concluding thoughts. All right, so disasters and governments, okay. Um, disasters are clearly a kind of increasing part of life. Uh, for, I think we're talking, this is globally, um, and I'll show a little bit of data about Asia later, uh, but this is something that um, we are going to have to live with. And, Disasters, I think many times when people think of disasters, they're thinking of the natural disasters. It's the cyclones or, you know, hurricanes or the earthquakes. Um, but many times uh, the United Nations or USAID or other governments are responding to disasters that have a much more kind of human component to them. Uh, one example, again, being in the Philippines, um, uh, there was a large, due to kind of a, a sort of uh, insurgent attacks in the southern island of Mindanao, a lot of people were displaced uh, when I was there. Uh, and that was considered a disaster as well. And there was assistance kind of brought in for that purpose. Um, so um, in, when these disasters strike, um, in almost every case, it's the government that's gonna be your primary kind of responder. Yes, we have the Red Cross and there may be you know, community organizations and certain first responders, uh, you know, medical personnel and that kind of thing. But when it comes to really kind of you know, coordinating the response and the kind of resources, it's governments that bring the most to that process. It's very, very rare uh, to have a sort of your, your best kind of disaster response be outside of your government. And that's true, I think, of all countries. Um, and, um, so the question is sort of, you know, again, you know, when do governments kind of make this decision uh, to, uh, you know, to, to declare a disaster, to ask for um, international assistance, okay? Um, and in this case, um, there's, it's, there's a little bit of a subtlety in this. So you sometimes find that governments just come out very clearly and say, my goodness, you know, we cannot handle this situation. Therefore, we are requesting international assistance, whether it comes from foreign governments, whether it comes from the United Nations, uh, whether it comes from people making contributions, diaspora movements, whatever it is. But there's other situations where governments don't actually, they don't put out a kind of formal appeal. They just simply indicate to everyone that they're willing to accept any assistance that happens to come. Um, and there's some subtle differences in those two, uh, but I just did want to make the point that uh, sometimes you see a, a, a real appeal, and then sometimes you see people say, well, you know, a government will say, well, uh, we don't want to perhaps uh, announce the fact that we're not capable of 
addressing a situation in the country. So we're, but, but, but if someone wants to provide a contribution, you know, we'll take it. Okay. So thinking a little bit about sort of something about sort of what sort of a little bit about the literature on disaster management, kind of what does this tell us? Um, as I said, there is scholarly work. Um, there is a kind of broader literature here on crisis management and what's sometimes now actually called risk governance. Um, and that word governance comes with a lot of uh, uh, sort of political implications as well. Um, what I've discovered about that literature is that it's, it's, it turns out to be very multidisciplinary. Um, you know, these responses and when people think about them, sometimes they emphasize psychology or they may you know, emphasize the kind of international relations component. Um, there's a strong public administration component to all of this. Uh, and then the thing that I'm gonna focus a bit more on today, which is more of the kind of the sort of political dynamics. Um, and I was, I have to say, I was a little bit surprised when I went through the literature and I'm not gonna tell you that my, my review was exhaustive for sure. Uh, I apologize, I had a kind of full-time job and I'm a practitioner uh, more than anything, um, so I was trying to kind of return to my academic roots a bit, but um, I didn't really see any kind of clear models or kind of if, uh, some of the, the theoretical, if you will, backing for how people think about crisis management. Um, so perhaps I was missing some piece of the literature there, but I, it was, uh, that was a little bit of a, a gap that I, I felt was there. and so I. Part of the, so I'm maybe responding a little bit here to that. Um, so where am I in kind of this? I'm really at that second green bullet point. I'm in the applied disaster management sort of realm, okay? So what are people like me, and there's many others, you know, across uh, many governments in the United Nations, we're, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about, well, geez, you know, what kind of supplies do you need? What kind of logistics? You know, how are we going to transport these things? What do we, you know, how are we going to get this stuff out to people? Um, what's the best way to distribute things? Uh, there can be situations, and I think you've probably seen this with food distributions, where uh, you get these chaotic situations uh, where there's no kind of you know crowd control. Uh, it's not managed well. The people that are you know handing out the aid are just simply just sort of throwing bags to whoever you know shows up first. That's these are the kinds of things that kind of occupy me in my work. Um, and so when you kind of look over this, um, this applied disaster management, so there's a lot of technical guidance. You know, how do you, how do, you do these things? How do you do just distributions? I think the piece that was missing to me in many ways was, well, but how do I kind of communicate with a government or how do I kind of read what a government is thinking about how they want, you know, do they want to declare a disaster? Are they willing to accept international assistance? What's, what's driving those kinds of decisions? And that, and that it seems to me is something that is not really in the technical guidance at all. Um, but as I was going through this, uh, I came across uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. You know, this is the UN, you know, sort of the U.S. government's uh, disaster kind of response and management agency. In one of their training manuals, they have a specific section that refers to how do you deal with politicians? And I, I had never seen that before in any of the other technical guidance they had read, you know, the international standards. And it was really kind of curious to me. They, they, uh, they have guidance on, so what happens when, you know, you get a phone call from a politician? You know, what are, you know, how do you deal with that? What are they, what are these people interested in? Um, what happens when a politician announces that they want to come and visit the disaster site, right? These kinds of things. And so there's, like I said, there's, so FEMA, to its credit, I think, understood that there's a real political element to these kinds of things. Uh, and so, uh, but I just honestly haven't, and I don't mean that as a criticism, but I just haven't seen that in the sort of guidance that I often read. So how do people make those decisions? Well, we oftentimes go to the person who's an expert, right? You know, oh, let's go talk to Al. Al's been talking with the government about this stuff all the time. So, you know, Al knows the ministers and the government. Al knows the officials. Let's, you know, we'll get him to tell us what's going on, um, what, this, what the government's thinking about something. But that's not a very systematic way to do this kind of work. Um, so this is something I was thinking about. Um, so developing, for me at least, developing a model is challenging. Um, partly because it's, it's very multi, kind of, you know, sort of disciplinary. There's a lot of different factors. But also, too, so disasters involve a lot of very incomplete information. 
Um, things are, tend to be moving very fast. There's very little time to, you know, to analyze the situation. Um, you've got people who are literally you know, flooded out. They're on their roofs. This is, this is not a time for uh, kind of the normal processes of deliberative governance uh, and bureaucratic back and forth and you know, talking with your legislature. Something sort of needs to be done. Um, and there's strong emotions now. People, uh, you know, there's, there's oftentimes a sense, and I think this is, you know, particular, it's been true all over the world, but I think it's actually very, very true in Southeast Asia. Um, we've got to do something. We've got to help our fellow Indonesians. We've got to help our fellow Malaysians, our fellow Thais, whatever it is. And that actually drives some of this as well. So when you're in these kinds of situations, that the, the politics, it sort of opens up a window uh, for kind of these, some of these political factors to kind of, you know, come into play. Um, and there are various, if we're, I'm treating politics and political factors in a kind of you know, broad sense. Um, you've got national government officials, but you've also got local government officials who can be very, very important in driving these decisions. Uh, you've got civil society actors. And then the international donor community, um, you know, whether it's an organization like mine, uh, other governments, uh, the United Nations, they're all kind of you know, involved in these things. And, and sometimes in certain situations, they're just very influential constituencies and you know, groups. So you've got this sort of very kind of political dynamic here. Okay. So the main question I really just want to focus, and I'm just really focusing here on Southeast Asia, um, you know, how, does the, you know, how do governments make that decision or what are some of the factors that they take into account when they're to you know, make this declaration for a disaster appeal for international assistance or be willing to accept the assistance. Um, and I just thought Southeast Asia was kind of a fascinating place to explore this topic, right? Um, you've got quite a sort of diversity of countries, but, um, but you know, most of the countries in the region uh, regularly experience disasters. So you've got this kind of, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a part of the world that's very disaster prone. Some nations obviously more than others. You know, but every country I've ever worked in in Southeast Asia has, you know, has had, uh, you know, disasters of kind of various kinds. And the diversity of their kind of government systems, the political histories in a kind of relatively small, you know, kind of geographic area, I think is also helpful uh, to think about these things. Um, but also, so COVID-19, um, when I started kind of looking at this, uh, and I'm going to move on to the next slide, actually. Um, but... When I started doing this presentation uh, and thinking about this talk, um, uh, I didn't think that COVID-19 was gonna come into it as kind of as much as it has uh, in terms of thinking about what motivates you know, governments when they uh, look to an appeal for international assistance. So I think what you're gonna find is, is that um, I'm gonna be talking a fair amount about the COVID-19 situation. Um, so that's just a little foreshadow a little bit. So, Again, this is the so what part, right? Why would we care? Um, as you can see, we've got a circle here for uh, the number of disasters, uh, you know, sort of by continent. Um, you know, Asia is very much kind of at the, at the top of the list, if you will, the, the largest circle there. Um, and you can see uh, a little bit of a breakdown between some of the countries. Obviously, Asia is a lot more than Southeast Asia because we've got countries like India and China and Afghanistan in there. Uh, but I just did want to make the point that, you know, as a region, um, it's, uh, it's, this is very much a kind of a, a salient issue for them. Um, and then, you know, what sort of, you know, share of, you know, of, of deaths as well. Again, uh, Asia is a pretty significant one. The, um, so the, the, the numbers in uh, the dark blue, let's see, I want to make sure I get this right. I think the dark blue is from 2000 to um, 2000, the year 2000 to the year 2019, actually. Yeah, that's correct. So this is your sort of share of deaths. Uh, excuse me, so I'm sorry. The, the, the blue is the share of deaths in, in the year of sort of 2020. Um, and then the, the sort of greenish, the kind of aqua color is actually from uh, the decade prior, so 2000 to 2019. And I think my point I kind of want to make here is, is that um, those blue circles are rather large. Um, you know, so the, you know, the, the share of deaths is actually, you know, remains uh, quite significant. And actually, it's, what's actually maybe a, a little more scary is the fact that the Europe, uh, 
circle has actually grown quite a lot as well. And you would think that they would have quite well established uh, uh, kind of um, capabilities in response. And then thinking to, uh, if you're wondering where the photo is from, this is, um, uh, this is actually from uh, Laos, which is the country I'm, I'm working in right now. This is the uh, 2018 uh, dam collapse in, the, in, the, in Atapu province. Um, this was, uh, I'm not going to get into details on this one, but it was, uh, um, it was quite devastating in that, in that area. Um, my point is that the decision to sort of declare can really have huge impacts, and I'm particularly thinking of COVID-19 here, right? That decision to accept international assistance, that decision, you know, and what kinds of international assistance they were accepting, uh, was a, it was a, a, a big deal. And I think we're, you know, seeing that in a number of countries that I'm going to talk about a bit. Uh, across the region. Um, and then thinking about the broader question here, um, if we're in a world, uh, and Southeast Asia included for sure, where we've got increasing sort of crises, um, you know, is there something that we can maybe learn about what's gone, you know, from the past? Uh, is, there, is there something that my very, very minute contribution to this uh, will, will hopefully, you know, enlighten us a little bit about, you know, what we can do better? Sorry. Um, so again, um, I'm not going to try and tell you that this is a uh, a rigorous, you know, kind of academic presentation. Um, and I think that there's a lot more work that could be done. So my points are really, again, based on many of the things that I think I was have experienced in working in countries across the region. Um, and I should probably tell you that um, I've worked in. So in terms of countries where I've worked that have, you know, that have had disasters and where I've been had a, a direct or some, sometimes indirect responsibility, uh, Philippines, um, Laos now, uh, let's see, India, um, Pakistan, um, Afghanistan, uh, and actually there's another country which is definitely not in Asia, but Madagascar, uh, where I, was, I spent almost four years. In all of those countries, I've been... Um, or almost all those countries, I've been a, a kind of a, a, a point person uh, for USAID and actually oftentimes for the American embassies on, you know, sort of disaster response. So a lot of conversations with governments, a lot of trips out, you know, looking at relief efforts, uh, figuring out what kind of resources could be brought in. So it's something that's kind of very, if you will, close to my, close to my heart, you know, to be doing this kind of work. So it does make a real difference to me. So um, in thinking about some of the factors that I, I have seen that I would sort of consider sort of more on the political side, uh, one I think is just legitimacy. Um, uh, FACE, a term that I think we often hear in, in association with, with many countries in Southeast Asia, um, you know, governments want to show that they're, you know, caring, that they're benevolent, that they're taking action, that they're doing something. Um, uh, in particular, they want to show that they can provide for their, for their own people's needs. And so you find, um, when you think about sort of disaster declarations, that this is actually, in my experience, this has been a, a, a critical motivating factor. You know, can, the, you know, does the government um, feel like, you know, it, it's going to want to go out and ask for international assistance? Is it going to lose face or will it maintain a certain level of legitimacy? Um, and some of the examples I'm putting up here, um, so, but it was interesting to me, um, you know, countries like Thailand, uh, and I think uh, in many cases the Philippines as well, actually appealing for international assistance, declaring disaster actually has not really been much of an issue with legitimacy. Um, and my, you know, in my experience and even through so, a lot of the literature that I read, uh, there are some, some, you know, s details in that. Um, but generally speaking, when a natural disaster comes, there's, there's a certain amount of, you know, maybe, uh, you, know, you know, grumbling that might happen. Oh, the government could have done a better job, or why didn't they, you know, reinforce a dam or build up levees or, you know, provide better assistance. But um, they, that seems to, you know, that, that grumbling and complaining seems to pass, for, you know, kind of fairly quickly. Uh, and so you often find um, that, you know, this is not uh, causing serious kind of legitimacy problems for governments. Um, I think the one kind of curious exception to that is the country where I am now, which is Laos. Um, they're quite sensitive there uh, in, a, in a way that um, has been a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit surprising to me. Um, and 
and I'm not going to tell you that the, the Lao government is on, you know, on the verge of any sort of political collapse, right? I mean, things are actually quite stable there. Um, but they very, very clearly have a real concern about, you know, bringing in foreign assistance unless the disaster is really, really, you know, significant and they're getting a huge amount of pressure from outside. Um, that's, that's, that's been my understanding. Now this, what I've just said to you is in relationship to kind of natural disasters. COVID has been a much different animal, okay? <laughs> it really has. Uh, and um, I'm sure that some of you who are, you know, know something about Thailand and have been following the situation there, you know, kind of understand that, uh, you know, the legitimacy issue related to COVID-19 not accepting the, uh, I don't know if the, the COVAX, if that's a familiar term to people. This is the, this is the international kind of, um, uh, kind of coalition, if you will, that is leading uh, the provision of, of COVID-19 vaccines to, to, you know, to countries that need it, that, uh, that have sort of signed on to the service, if you will. Um, and Thailand did not accept COVAX initially. So in a sense, what Thailand was doing is saying, well, We've got a disaster where we didn't sort of declare it in a sense, but we're not going to accept international assistance except, except Chinese vaccines, at least initially. That's changed now. Um, but boy, uh, and then a failed local vaccine production policy as well. They ran into a huge legitimacy problem. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit later about the fact that um, you know, a natural disaster like a, you know, a, a cyclone or an earthquake looks rather different from COVID-19. There are some real distinctions, and so I don't want to make, make these two bullet points you know, sound like we're dealing with something that, you know, that can be very, very clearly compared. But it was really, really striking to see the difference between what happened with historically with a long series of kind of disasters, including you know, the 2004 tsunami. Yeah? I mean, you know, for those of you who kind of remember that, you'll remember the 2004 tsunami. I mean, it was a there was just a kind of an international, just sort of, you know, collective sense that, you know, something has to be done. And governments were definitely not going to, you know, refuse that kind of assistance. They were, in fact, they were welcoming it. Um, so that's the Thailand situation. COVID-19 in the Philippines. Um, and again, I'm not an expert on all of these countries. And I wasn't in the Philippines, obviously, when COVID-19, you know, struck. But you, you get this kind of a little bit different sense of kind of what I think we think of kind of legitimacy in the Philippines, which is, um, you know, the, um, the government is, you know, kind of effective and the government is caring and benevolent, but, <laughs> but that, that's only true if you're following what the government is telling you to do, right? Um, so there's a kind of a sort of government knows best aspect to, to legitimacy here. And in a sense, you know, if you're uh, those who are, if you will, against that kind of uh, the policies that you know, particularly you know, the Duterte government is uh, is is kind of used uh, in the Philippines. Um, there's you know you there's a face issue there for sure. Um, Laos again, but was quite again sort of flipping this on its head. A kind of historical reluctance to accept um, a kind of declare disaster and accept international assistance, but they sure didn't do that with COVID nineteen. They readily accepted existence, right? And whether it came from, uh, you know, whether it came from China. So the initial vaccines for COVID-19 that came in were from China. It was the Sinopharm vaccine. But you know, we sitting at USAID very quickly got word that boy, they, they, you know, the Lao government was was very much interested in, you know, an AstraZeneca vaccine and a Pfizer. They signed up for the COVAX facility, you know, to get the to get vaccines shipped over there. There was really no hesitancy whatsoever. So again, I just really think that COVID is just a kind of a different animal uh, and a different kind of disaster than we've been seeing historically. Um, looking a little bit sort of kind of political power structure, um, this general term that I'm using here encompasses quite a, quite a large number of things uh, that you can see up there. You know, you've got sort of a local national power balance. Uh, you know, are there certain domestic constituencies that are, you know, what's the military's role? This is obviously an important question for a number of countries in Southeast Asia. And then the question of civil society. Um, 
So what I found, again, in my own experience and, and based on my reading is, is that, um, and uh, I'd be happy to, if somebody has a different view on this, I'd be welcome to hear it because these are very sort of initial ideas on my part. Um, but I haven't seen a whole lot of, if you will, impact on that decision to, uh, you know, kind of declare a disaster from, uh, based on the sort of structure of the politics. Uh, it seems like the sort of, in some ways, other factors like the you know the, the legitimacy side of things seems to have more of a an influence. Now again, I'm and when I talk about when I make that statement, I'm talking more about sort of more of the natural disasters and maybe uh, you know the, this kind of situation I mentioned, for example, you know displaced people. Um, there are a few kind of exceptions here for sure, uh, and one of the curious ones here is that. Um, you find actually that, um, uh, well, first of all, you know, disadvantaged groups may gain a certain amount of attention that they don't get normally, right? Uh, and there's this feeling, again, it's the, the feeling that you know, we, the government or people have to respond to a disaster almost overrides other kind of factors. Under normal circumstances, these people probably wouldn't be getting a lot of access to government resources and kind of government attention. Um, and they may be, um, you know, very much disadvantaged and kind of, you know, set aside. But boy, a disaster occurs, and suddenly there's this large number of resources that kind of come in. The issue is, is that it's, that is all very tends to be very short term, right? So again, the so the decision to declare a disaster may be to their advantage, uh, and but it, it may not last very long. Uh, the other piece to this, which is actually obviously important, is the role of military. Um, <clears throat> I think we've seen both here in the U.S. and in European countries, and really all over the world, no matter what. You know, the, when a real disaster strikes, you know, governments often lean on the military to you know to do something, um, and uh, that actually can create a certain level of kind of legitimacy issues. People, in some cases, in May, in some cases where I've seen. Uh, bringing in the military is the kind of thing where people say, well, this is what we need. Like, great, the government is bringing in the military. They should do this because, because the government can't handle it. In other cases, people say, well, that's strange. You know, why should soldiers be doing this kind of work? Soldiers are here to defend the country. You know, civil servants, other government officials should be doing the response. So you get that kind of a mix, and it depends. Um, uh, and there are certain cases where certain politicians, and I think this is actually fairly rare, Certain politicians will use a disaster declaration as a way to get resources, which they feel that they can then direct to certain uh, um, constituencies that are, are, are useful to them. So that motivates them to declare because they're thinking, ah, I can get some money that I didn't previously have. The problem with that is that I think some of the politicians don't understand is that in the world of international disaster assistance, um, those funds tend to be very kind of uh, you know, restricted in what they can be used for. Uh, and we do, you know, we and many others, you know, the UN, we monitor those quite carefully. And so it's, it would actually be quite difficult for a politician to be able to divert any substantial amount of resources like that. So I actually don't think that that's a major factor. Um, so COVID-19, I think, again, a much different kind of situation. And then I'll talk a little bit about why COVID-19, I think, is different from uh, say a, you know like a natural disaster like a cyclone. Um, again, in the you know in the Thai case, my interpretation, and I um, I'm open to other ideas on this. There were very very powerful domestic constituencies uh, that resisted the you know international assistance, um, and I think those those some of those constituencies kind of got burned uh, in the process. Um, they uh, you know it, when when the cost associated with not accepting assistance other than in this, you know, Chinese vaccines in this case, um, is really came to the fore. Now, of course, the Thai authorities have, have really sort of turned things around and changed quite a bit. But in some ways, you know, the damage has been done. The damage has been done and now they've got a serious legitimacy issue right now in Thailand that's, uh, that's, that's a critical part of the politics of this. Um, I think countries like Indonesia and Malaysia um, They've got more sort of somewhat a little more decentralized systems. The decision to declare a disaster is is all you know is generally a kind of a national government decision. 
Um, but what I've, what I've seen, and again, in my experience is that, um, and also in Laos too, local politicians actually can have a, a quite significant influence on kind of what those national politicians do in these kinds of kind of crisis sort of situations. Um, in the normal sort of deliberative politics, of course, um, there's, you know, there's much more sort of room for debate and, uh, and the different, you know, all the different players can have, have more time to have their say. As I pointed out earlier in the presentation, a disaster, you know, you don't have that kind of time to do the analysis. Uh, you've got this feeling that, you know, something needs to be done, whether for a moral reason or whether for legitimacy. And so what you find is, is that in certain cases you've got, um, you know, a local constituency or provincial officials, whatever, and they, they can sort of make the appeal to the central government and say, you've got to do something for my state, for my province. And, and you'll find that central governments will oftentimes react well to that. Um, and maybe sort of my last point here is sort of talking about sort of government resources, uh, sort of thinking about government kind of cap capacity and what sort of influence does this have on, on that decision to sort of declare and what are some of the political implications. Um, so uh, what's been curious to me, I think, is that um, uh, you know, disaster, sort of the capacity to um, respond to disasters in, in, in any number of countries, it's getting better. It's definitely gotten better since I started working for USAID 15 years ago, but it's still quite weak in a lot of areas. Um, but that, that lack of kind of capacity in some cases doesn't seem to have, uh, if you will, strongly influenced the, you know, kind of decision to declare, I, um, I think. Uh, that's, again, that's my interpretation. Um, it definitely doesn't, um, you know, capacity doesn't seem to have a whole lot of correlation, actually, honestly, with, with that decision to declare either. Um, maybe one exception to that might be the sort of, uh, you know, kind of the Philippines, uh, because they actually, I think of the countries in the region, they have a pretty good capacity, um, which has grown, uh, which has improved since I was there, and I was there in 2008 to 2010. Um, but the Philippines, the difference there is, is that the Philippines is much more prone to some very, very heavy disasters. You know, this is, uh, if some of you have been reading the news, a, a super typhoon actually just sort of skirted the sort of northern regions of the Philippines. Just, uh, it just passed through the country just a day or two ago. Um, and that's a fairly regular occurrence there. Um, so the government is actually pretty good at handling disasters, uh, except for the really major ones. But again, Think back to that first photo that I showed you. Politics can sort of, you know, flip that on its head a little bit in, in kind of unusual ways. Um, so, in terms of kind of, um, uh, and I kind of put a little point up here about um, about Cambodia, which is for me a sort of an open question. Um, uh, those of you I think who study Cambodia, I think know very well that uh, there's been a very much a sort of turn towards uh, sort of you know association with China. Um, and that's something that's uh, uh, a concern to some. I don't know if that's going to lead to, uh, for example, fewer declarations because Cambodia will say, well, we've got, our, we've got our Chinese friends. They will be able to help us in these kinds of situations. This is an open question. I just wanted to put it out. Uh, in terms of the sort of limited financial resources, um, uh, you know, is the government going to be willing, to, sort of unwilling to divert resources from activities where they have very sort of strong vested interests, right? You know, because they've got, you know, budget constraints or very kind of political factors. Um, again, I don't think this has had a huge influence. Um, when a disaster comes, they find resources. They, they find a way to uh, do it. And, um, and they may pull some resources from, you know, vested interests as part of the government, you know, kind of budget process. Um, but it doesn't seem to be that, uh, you know, for example, if the government is sort of putting all its resources into a lot of infrastructure, that they're going to have some huge reluctance to, you know, pull resources from those if they really need them. Uh, disasters are kind of that way. Um, but COVID-19, um, in terms of kind of government capabilities, I think it's very, it was very, very clear, uh, and I know we've got at least one public health expert in the audience, um, government disaster uh, kind of infrastructure and capabilities were very much focused on the natural disasters. They were not focused on, you know, kind of these sort of health disastrous pandemics. And so COVID-19 is 
brought out this huge gap uh, in the capability of governments to kind of respond to these things. And that's going to be a real subject of concern, I think, as we move on. Um, so I'm kind of here at my last slide, some concluding thoughts. I wanted to leave some time for questions. I'm sorry for going on a little bit long. OK, is there room for more work in this area? Definitely. You know, I think you can see from my presentation that it had a very kind of practical aspect to it. Um, I was trying to uh, react to a kind of a government literature, you know, a sort of a scholarly literature, um, but there's much more that could be done, particularly thinking about how to sort of model these situations, crisis sort of situations. Um, today I talked about the decision to declare a disaster. Um, that's one kind of narrow topic that I just focused on today just to make the presentation a little bit easier to follow, but there's a whole other aspect which is okay, well, what are the politics of actually managing the disaster kind of process? In other words, the government has you know, declared a disaster. Okay, well, then what happens? How does politics influence that? You know, where do the resources go? Um, how long do they last? Uh, you know, what kinds of groups get what sort of uh, resources? Or, you know, are certain groups going to be ignored? Are other groups going to get more attention paid to them? Uh, what does the reconstruction effort look like after a disaster? That can be a huge, huge political dynamics behind those. Uh, when people lose their homes, when people lose their livelihoods, uh, that has a lot of political dynamics. I haven't really discussed those today. That's a whole other area of research. Um, and I guess maybe what I was a little bit surprised by in some of my work is that um, you know, politics has not in, is a very sort of broad general point. Um, politics, other than maybe the legitimacy piece I noted, haven't driven uh, these decisions sort of you know, very uh, you know, heavily in terms of uh, um, declaring disasters. And in fact, I think a lot of it is just there's a kind of almost a sense of a sort of humanitarian and moral imperative, a sense that you have to take care of your people to some degree. Uh, that is what actually drives a lot of these things. However, again, COVID-19 comes into this. Um, it is highly political, and it's been that way right from the start. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, and, um, and I don't need to get into a deep analysis of this. You know, you've seen some of the, the, the points I made on earlier slides. Uh, this is a different kind of disaster, okay? And one thing I wanted to um, point out about, so the main difference for me between COVID-19 natural disasters is, or there's two main differences. One is COVID-19 affected everybody. It was a, very much a natural disaster. Very few, very few natural disasters are natural in scope. They tend to affect a, a limited area, a limited population. Uh, and so it's much easier for governments to kind of make those decisions and they don't get nearly as political. But when everybody's affected uh, and when the economic impacts are, you know, of, of, of such a sort of broad scale. It's one thing if your business is closed, you know, as, you know, for a week or two as you clean up from the flooding and then you reopen. It's an entirely different matter when your business has been closed down for a year or simply gone out of business. That's one. And then the second one is <clears throat> with, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> with international disaster response for natural disasters. <clears throat> so with that, you know, you provide, excuse me, <clears throat> when you provide assistance to a, for a natural disaster, what you're doing oftentimes is providing a kind of, you know, just you're, uh, there's no compliance issue, I guess is what I want to say, right? So, all right. And, you know, telling people COVID-19 uh, is, you know, wearing masks like what we're doing here, that's a compliance issue. So I'm going to close there because I know time is running short. And so uh, I would be pleased to take questions about this. I know I've covered quite a bit of area on this. So thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you. Water. Yeah. Water. <laughs> water. You always need water when you're talking yeah. to a mask. Um, Disaster assistance. Thank you. So thank you to Dr. Stern for the this really great talk. And I think it was broad and specific at the same time and really gave a good um, kind of taste of the politics of disaster relief. But um, first I wanted to ask from the audience here if there were any questions anybody wanted to ask. Oh yeah. 
And please say your name and um, who you are and where you're from. Um, so, um, my name is Monique Van Reenen. I'm a PhD candidate in linguistics and anthropology um, and work primarily in Indonesia. Um, but my question was thinking about the kind of cultural salience and variance and when you think about things like legitimacy and face um, across different cultural contexts. And so in kind of your question about um, a model for providing aid, I'm wondering about um, how much kind of these local cultural contexts come into play and then beyond just the political, I'm thinking about um, like Indonesia, for instance, when you're providing aid um, after the tsunami in Aceh and thinking about the um, religious context and providing relief in a way that's halal and um, fits with the Islamic context versus elsewhere um, that might not have the same kind of cultural or religious concerns or um, context. Yeah, no, that's a very, very good point. And that probably gets much more into sort of the, the question of, you know, how do you do the response as opposed to, you know, this bigger question I was using really just to narrow the topic for today, which is, you know, this question of declaring the disaster. Um, quite honestly, in my experience, um, you know, governments tend not to really think about those kinds of cultural, if you will, factors or norms, you know, when they make those kind of big declarations. They sort of, they leave it up to, you know, your, you know your, either your disaster management authority or your local officials, and then the international donors come in uh, and, and provide some assistance as well. And, but you do run into problems in that area for sure, right? You know, uh, uh, one example that's in Asia, although not in Southeast Asia, uh, Pakistan. Uh, when I was there, and this was 2009, I believe, um, they had tremendous flooding. I mean, just really massive, massive flooding. Uh, but they're, they're, what, when many people in Pakistan cook, they cook with a huge amount of oil. And I think some of the international assistants, they were not prepared for the sort of demand that came through for just this, like, you know, I mean, they wanted two, like, big, you know, containers of cooking oil. That's what they wanted. Uh, and that's and that's what then that's something that had to be addressed, and so that sort of changed, you know, the thinking. It's like, oh my goodness, you know, we have to figure out how we gonna respond to that. How we gonna get you know this quantity of this oil to people, and so a lot of scrambling associated with those sorts of things. There's probably a lot of work that could be done to think more carefully about how you account for those those local contexts. That's a good question. Can I ask a follow up to that? Sure. So um, to follow up more in line with, I guess, this question of declaring disaster, um, so thinking about intra-country politics and especially in what you mentioned, kind of the more decentralized areas, I was wondering your thoughts on um, when a, a national government declares disaster and its political interests, for instance, when you have um, in a country like Indonesia where you have a disaster may be occurring in, in West Papua where there's the political, um, or the tricky political climate and the separatist movements yes. versus maybe somewhere in Java, how those um, politics come into play when there are certain regions that the government might be more amenable to, to providing um, or declaring disaster in order to provide aid. Yep. Yeah, no, again, you know, a very good point and a, actually a very good example, um, you know, sort of Indonesia, you know, kind of Papua New Guinea that, uh, you know, I, I kind of made the point that it, you know, in my, in my own experience that it hasn't seemed to be, you know, a, a sort of a major factor, at least not in the, in the, in the declaration. Uh, but I do believe that if someone were to do further research that you would find that uh, it's, again, a huge, it could potentially have a huge impact on the sort of level of resources that are provided. It's, in some ways, it's relatively easy to do the declaration, right? You know, in, in many cases. Uh, it's, it's a much more kind of complicated and difficult effort, you know, to make the hard decisions about, well, you know, here's the amount of, uh, you know, government budget that we're willing to set aside for this. And, okay, well, you know, that's, and then politics very, very much comes into play in those things uh, in different ways. And I would guess, actually, that, for example, something like, you know, kind of political structure, um, local national power dynamics. It's a great area for research, actually, if you think about it, because you could really learn a lot uh, in terms of sort of, you know, when governments think of it this way. So when governments are sort of put on the spot 
and you could say the same thing about people, right? Put someone into a crisis situation. If you really want to know how they're going to act, if you really want to know what their true colors are, that's, that's going to be a pretty strong indication. Uh, so, if, so if Papua New Guinea is not getting you know, a certain level of resources or somewhere similar, it's like, ah, that's a, probably a fairly strong indication of what's uh, an underlying dynamic. Yeah. Yes. My name is Hiu Fung, and I uh, do a little bit environmental history, of course, focus on the pre-modern time, but I can see a lot of uh, overlapping theme with what the current government now they are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very curious about, uh, probably you can uh, share with us uh, the case of Laos. Like, when we talk about declaration of disasters, is it like Western idea? Uh, because in the yeah. U.S., we really, we, it is a real common sense when the government declare emergency. It's, for us, right away, we interpret it as the need for funding, the need for support. But what, the, what kind of the um, disaster reporting system occur in a country like Laos? Like how the, the commoner know that there's disaster? And for practitioner like you, how you communicate with the government? Like, how do you know that in the country now it's the time that they they accept that they are experiencing a disaster? Because COVID nineteen is something kind of like a clear or big hit, but there are a lot of other kind of disasters which occurs in a more local area, which not necessarily that the. Uh, the central government will accept it right away. So how this process of information, you know, communicates between you, government, and, and commoners in the country? Yeah, yeah, and I could give some examples uh, from Laos, but some of these things apply to other countries as well, for sure. Um, so one of, the, one of the curious things about Laos is despite the fact that it is a one-party state and, uh, you know, and, and very much kind of a central control, um, it turns out to actually be, be very, for lack of a better term, almost feudal uh, in, in some of its kind of actual power structures. And so um, you sometimes find that the government will not, there's a disaster in a, in a certain you know, province or a certain region, and they won't declare the disaster as a sort of a national thing. They'll just say, well, you know, we're dispatching some resources to that area, and that, that area has a disaster, and but, the, but that's it. There's no appeal for international assistance in the way that I was, you know, describing. So that's that's something that's you know, we see actually fairly often from the Lao authorities. Uh, you know, they they really they really treat these things as a, in many ways sort of localized, uh, you know, kinds of situations. And and you sometimes see that in other countries. Um, and the motivations for that can be you know different. In some cases, it may be a question of legitimacy. In other cases, it may be that, well, you know, Thailand may be able to handle flooding in, you know, in a select group of provinces without actually having to put out a broad appeal and say, ah, you know, we must have international assistance. We can't handle this. So that's something that, um, you know, kind of comes into play uh, in the, you know, these decisions. And it's the other thing I'd say is declaring a disaster, um, you know, there's different ways to declare, right? Uh, you know, my main, the main point I made earlier was, well, you can directly ask for international assistance or you can just simply very passively say, well, we have a disaster and, you know, we will accept international assistance. Those are actually rather different things and send a rather different signal to be, you know, sort of demanding it and simply sort of saying, well, if you give it to us, we'll take it, we'll accept it. Uh, so that's part of the dynamic as well. I hope I partly answered your question. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Joseph. I'm a Fulbright foreign language teaching assistant from the Philippines. Do you think, sir, that um, declaration of a national disaster or even just disaster for, for a country is politically driven? If so, do you see any, any uh, point of corruption at bay? Mm, that's a good question. So when I, when I put up my, that slide where I talked about uh, uh, sort of the political structure and you know, local groups and the balance of power between your national and your local politicians, 
I mean, in a sense, you might say that you know behind that there could be a certain level of corruption, right? Um, and uh, you know, as I said, it's entirely possible that you're going to get politicians, um, you know, who are more powerful and have a very strong interest in directing a certain amount of resources to their areas. And I have seen this, you know, in reality. Uh, I mean, there was. Uh, I mean, I'll, let me just briefly cite a case from the Philippines. Um, it was a very curious situation. So Mount Mayon, uh, which I'm sure you know, uh, this is a volcano that erupts every once in a while. Um, and in this case, this is in 2000, I think this was, I think, late 2009, uh, it erupted. And um, there was a real sort of debate that kind of went on about, well, should we declare a disaster in, in association with this? Because, I mean, almost, there were almost no deaths associated with it. It, it drove a certain number of people away from the area around the volcano, but it wasn't, uh, how do I say, sort of like a very, uh, I mean, it definitely, it, it didn't affect a huge number of people, and, and many people in that area know what Mount Moyon can do anyway. I mean, they've seen it erupt before. But the governor of the province at that time uh, was, uh, and I'm forgetting his name right now, but was fairly powerful, and somehow, negotiated a, a kind of a declaration and, 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 and some an international assistance came in, uh, which to me was actually quite curious because, um, and I'm speaking very honestly here, I don't think it warranted it. I just don't, I think the Philippine authorities could have easily, easily handled that situation. But again, uh, so it does happen sometimes for sure. Uh, so that decision to declare and accept international assistance um, can, be subject to a certain amount of political influence and corruption. My main point here was is that, just very broadly speaking, I don't see a lot of that. I see a few exceptional cases, but it doesn't seem to be a... Now, the provision of disaster assistance, not the declaration, you know, how do you hand it out? Yes, there can be corruption there for sure. Uh, and, and many times it happens on a kind of a smaller scale with local politicians and local officials. Yeah, so that's a real issue, which is why it's very, you have to be very careful to be, a, you know, to make sure that when you hand out or you're giving people assistance or in whatever form, that there's some kind of accountability uh, behind it. Uh, because if you don't, it's, it, a lot of times it just disappears. Or people take it and they sell it. That's a, that's a very common practice as well. Um, I guess for a last question, we have some um, someone from our virtual audience that chimes in. Sure. Um, can an in-country international aid organization mobilize to react to a disaster prior to an official declaration of the disaster? In the sort of international, somewhat sensitive diplomatic world that I often live in, I think the basic answer is no. Um, you can the best we can probably do is sort of start to mobilize a bit because we think the, the government might declare a disaster. So, you know, just again, to take an example from USAID, um, we will, and I've done this many times, we think that the government is gonna declare. So, but before that happens, we're calling people up and saying, okay, you know, what kind of organizations could potentially provide assistance? Um, what kind of assistance do we think you know, is actually going to be needed? Um, do we need you know, some kind of military transport uh, to bring it in uh, you know, kind of quickly, or maybe not? Um, and the United Nations um, you know, will, do the, will do the same thing as well. So there's a lot of work that kind of goes in and a lot of discussions that go into sort of thinking about preparing for what could be a declaration, but we cannot move you know, and bring resources in until the government, you know, says so, because there's a sovereignty issue there. And that's, that's a big, big deal for us. You can't, you can't just fly stuff in. Uh, and, and governments, you know, have every right to say, I know you've got a plane in the air, but, and I know it's full of relief supplies, but we're not gonna get it, let it land because you didn't ask us for permission first. That can happen. Good questions. So I think with that, we'll end our first seminar of the year for our Center for Southeast Asian Studies seminar series. And a big round of applause for Dr. Stern and for our support staff at the International Institute who helped us bring 
something in person, which has been really exciting for us. Please do see the CIS website for the remainder of our seminar series, CIS at umich.edu, with any questions or comments. And we look forward to seeing everybody virtually or in person soon. Thank you so much. And thank you again, Dr. Stern, for a tremendous talk. Thank you. Really appreciate it.